Um, hello, everybody. Uh, we are happy to have you here. Please introduce yourself in the chat box by including your name and country. And we have one minute to go. All right, let's begin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Five Perspectives on Music Librarianship. Thank you so much for joining this meeting. The webinar was organized by IFLA New Professional Special Interest Group and International Association of Music Libraries, Archives, and Documentation Center. We are going to take an hour to take a deep dive into the music librarianship. Experts from the field will highlight five different aspects of music in many various libraries. Presentations will only cover a small part of the topic, but we hope it will be a good starting point for anybody to learn more. So I would like to say only a few words about organization of the webinar for the beginning. My name is Magdalena Gomułka and I work in the Silesian Library in Poland. Uh, I am convenor of uh, IFLA New Professional Special Interest Group. Uh, it's an uh, initiative for and by uh, new professionals. Mm, we say that uh, our goal is to welcome uh, new professionals uh, to uh, IFLA and in international cooperation uh, by hosting uh, personal and virtual events, conference meetings, and uh, sharing information for new librarians. Uh, I will be also uh, your host uh, for this webinar today. Uh, this meeting um, is being recorded, including chat. If you have to leave, don't worry, recording will be posted on our blog, npsig.wordpress.com. And more information about the G GDPR and data you can find on IFLA and Zoom website. And now a word about our communication. Uh, your microphones uh, have been muted for this event. Uh, you can ask questions by using the chat box. Please remember to indicate which panelist you are addressing the question. In a situation when we exit meeting time, all questions uh, will be answered in writing after the webinar and made available in a document on our blog. I guess many of you are wondering why we decided to organize this amazing topic of the webinar. So let me uncover this secret. In New Professionals, uh, in collaboration with uh, IAM, uh, organized the session Music in the Library World next year. So this webinar, Five Perspectives on Music Librarianship, is an introduction to showing many aspects of music in libraries and to our next step, music competition and online session during the IFLA Congress. We would like to present uh, our first music competition for librarians. We want to see the important role libraries and music have in your life. What do you need to prepare? a song with a melody and with lyr lyrics if you would like. In your music project, present your passion for libraries and the community where you work. 
even you are not a professional musician, take part in our comp competition. For this special occasion, we, call, we can all be artists together. For more info, check our blog and special website npsgmusiccontest.wordpress.com. So just for uh, one minute, I would like to ask uh, all of you to use the ball which you have at the bottom. And uh, please answer uh, in which library do you work? It will be great to know which libraries are with us today. Okay, so you have a one minute and we will know everything about you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will launch polling and we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many numbers. Okay. So I see that uh, we have uh, people, librarians from academic libraries. It's uh, near a half of our attendee. Public libraries are also with us and also the special libraries. We welcome also librarians for full libraries. So thank you very much for uh, voting and we can go next. Okay, so uh, my speakers have uh, got a lot to cover today. Let's go ahead at, uh, and take a look at our agenda. So at the beginning, we are going to find out more about uh, IAM, the International Association uh, for Music Libraries. Then mm -hmm. uh, you will hear more about music collections and services in libraries and bibliographical series. So we have amazing speakers with us today. Please welcome Pia Schreckheft, Anders Kato, Caroline Doi and Sean Luke, Jonathan Manton, Sebastian Wilke and Barbara McKenzie. Uh, our first uh, speakers, uh, Pia Schechter and Anders Kato, uh, please uh, uh, share your screen. I will stop and share your screen to show the presentation and turn on your mic microphones. Uh, Anders? Yes. Uh, and yeah, Magdalena, do you want me to start? I just uh, I have a short introduction without a PowerPoint. Uh, okay, okay, you can uh, start sharing your screen and I have only one minute to introduce you. So, um, Pia is a president-elect of uh, IAM and works in the music and drama library in Gothenburg. Anders uh, is a secretary of IAM and senior advisor of the Danish Ad Agency for Culture and Palace. And IAM uh, currently has about 1,700 individual and in institutional members in around 40 countries throughout the world. This association was found in 1951 to promote international cooperation between music institutions and to support the interests of the profession. IAM has in national branches in 24 countries, five institutional sections, four subject sections, and various project groups. 
and is responsible for several large-scale documentation projects. It's a great opportunity to have members of EAM board here listen to the presentation and ask questions. So, Pia, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the initiative to arrange a webinar about different perspectives on music librarianship and thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure for us to introduce to YAML, International Association of Music Libraries, Archives and Documentation Centers. Among YAML's principal aims, you find the objective, quote, to cooperate with other organizations in the fields of librarianship, bibliography, archival science, documentation, music, and musicology, unquote. IFLA is certainly one of our closest allies. YAML is a respected member of the International Library Research and Music Communities. The association was founded under the auspices of UNESCO in 1951 to promote international cooperation between music scholars and music librarians after the end of World War II. The war had substantially affected the documentary musical heritage of many European countries. Many libraries were completely destroyed or had had their holdings decimated or relocated. International contacts had been interrupted for many years. The close contact between YAML and the International Musicological Society still prevails. We also collaborate closely with the International Association of Sound Archives and the International Music Council and other affiliated members. YAML embraces all kinds of libraries, archives and documentation centers with an international breadth of our membership and a wide variety of skills and expertise. From large and prestigious research libraries to small public libraries in cities and towns all over the world, as well as different kinds of academic institutions, conservatoires, broadcasting and orchestra libraries and private institutions. The national branches form the backbone of our association by accomplishing important work at the local level. Libraries are, as you know, democratic institutions that play an important role when it comes to social inclusiveness and the integration of new arrivals. The music department is especially welcoming since music is a language everybody understands. Music brings people together and YAML's members make music internationally accessible. We work internationally on multiple fronts to promote and protect tangible and intangible musical heritage among diverse cultures throughout the world. The importance of music in the lives of the world's peoples is something we cherish and feel responsible for. I would like to finish by, em by emphasizing that YAML membership is open to any person or institution interested in our work. You are all warmly welcome to join us. Information about how to become a member is available on our website, yaml.info. And uh, I now hand over to our Secretary General, Anders Kofu. So let's see, I hope everyone can hear me now. I have the sound on. Yes, everything is fine. You hear me? Fine. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm Anders Kofu and I'm Secretary General of YAML. I hope to see the screen too, and I will try and move forward. That would be a bit more complicated. Here it is. International collaboration is necessary, both to ensure that the special needs of music are not overlooked in the general library framework, and to achieve better sharing of resources and information within the music library community itself. These words from our website are, of course, not valid only for YAML, but just as much for any other specialized international organization. The music library community has specific interests and needs, and that is why YAML is of so much use to help libraries protect that. That may also be a reason as to why YAML has never ended up as a, just a section within IFLA, which one might think would be more logical sometimes. The first suggestions for a music library organization go back to 1949. In 1949, the Florentine Accademia Nazionale Cherubini, founded in 1811, 
played host to a celebratory congress of music scholars, librarians, and muse museum curators with a ceremonial opening in the venerable Palazzo Vecchio on the 27th of October that year, a try to unite musical Europe after World War II. This premier congrès de bibliothèque musicale was attended by some 60 participants from 12 countries. The final establishment of JAM actually took place in 1951 and was supported by UNESCO. As you can see, its main aim is to promote international cooperation and support the interests of the profession. Currently, we have a bit more than 1,700 members. Just like IFLA, YAML organizes an annual Congress, usually about a month before the IFLA World Library and Information Congress. Sometimes we have them in cooperation or conjunction with meetings of other music-related library or archive organizations. Fontes Artis Musicae is YAML's main journal. It is peer-reviewed with usually many interesting articles and reports. It is free of charge for our members and is accessed via EBSCO, JSTOR and Project any person or institution interested in joining the association is welcome. Most members join via the national branch, but if there is no national branch, you can also join YAM directly as an individual member. We have members from all parts of music life, from ordinary music libraries to documentation specialists and archivists and music publishers and suppliers. The principal aims of our organization are maybe not so different from the ones of IFLA. It is to encourage and promote the activities of music libraries, archives and documentation centers and strengthen cooperation among individuals and institutions working in these fields. Promote better understanding of the cultural importance of music libraries, archives and documentation centers nationally and internationally. Promote the particular needs of music within the general library framework. Support projects that improve the provision of music services through bibliography, cataloging, preservation, digitization and research and promote professional education and training. The main difference is probably that we have music librarianship in focus on this. YAML is run by a board that consists of a president, a treasurer, a secretary general, and four officers. In addition to that, the immediate past president or the president-elect takes part in the board. In the year after an election, it is the president-elect taking part, and then after the president-elect has taken over as president, it will be the outgoing president that becomes past president. And here are just some memories from last year's board meeting in Krakow. This year we have of course had not had any physical meeting, but still we managed to hold a full week of online presentations, discussions and other activities on Zoom, something that went very well and appeared to have been very much appreciated. Yamla's national branch is in 26 countries now. National branches usually serve as that country's music library organization. In some of the countries, where there is no national branch, the members sometimes come together in groups that are not formally constituted as young national branches. In countries that lack a strong music library or archive tradition, the establishment of a national branch of YAML can be a first step in increased activity and improved standards at the national level. As I said before, in countries where there is no branch, music librarians can still join YAML as individual members. A forum of national representatives advises the board on matters of national concern and other issues facing the association. The forum of national representatives meets at the annual congress. Institutional sections bring together members working in the same professional field or type of institution and meet as, as open forums to discuss common concerns and to exchange views and information. The workspaces of the institutional sections on the YAML website are open for everybody to use. There are also subject sections in YAML. Subject sections deal with the same type of activity and focus on new developments within their sphere of interest in different countries. Give sessions on selective aspects of their work and initiate new projects. The workspace of the subject sections on the YAML website are open for everybody to use as well. The chairs of the institutional sections and the subject sections constitute the forum of sections which oversees the planning of the annual Congress program and advise the board on other matters relating to the particular, their particular areas of interest. YAML also has committees within the organization. Committees carry out specific assignments to advise the association on administrative and legal matters dealing with questions of interest to the whole association. Right now, these are the most prominent ones. There are also ad hoc committees that exist for a shorter period of time to look into a special issue or problem. YAML is a member of several other international organizations and institutions, some of the most important ones are listed here, like YAML is also affiliated with many organizations, such as the ones mentioned on this page. 
Yaml co-sponsors with other international associations, notably the IMS, International Musicological Society, four major bi bibliographical series for music scholars and librarians, the 4R project. These are all produced by cooperation between national groups and international center responsible for collecting and coordinating national contributions. The series may be ordered from their respective publishers and you have the links on this page. And later now, you will also hear more about the art project from Barbara Dobson Kensey. And here is a list of the publications channels that we use and their respective names and links to them. Fontes Artes Musicae, an academic peer reviewed journal free of charge for all young members, as I said before. And as I said, this is accessible through EBSCO, JSTOR, and Project Me. And then I have just some example pictures from our communications channels, like the, the YAML website, and you have the Facebook page, our Instagram, and finally, a quotation from Roger Fleury, YAML president between 2010 and 2013. The music librarian is too often the unsung hero of the music profession, but any musician or music scholar will tell you that without the library foundation and the professional services that it provides, the platform and pillars of music will collapse. One cannot survive without the other. And that was my short introduction to Yama. Thank you very much for your attention. Um. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Pia and Anders. And I would like to say more about um, our next speakers. So uh, we have uh, Caroline Dolly and Sean Luke. Uh, Caroline Dolly from the University of uh, Saskatchewan and uh, Sean Luke from University of Alberta in Canada. Caroline is a music librarian and her research is focused on special collections. Sean is a digital project librarian. Uh, it's important to mention that they both work on the project uh, Sounds of Home, exploring local music collections and collecting practices in Canada. Today, the topic is local music collections in libraries, public, community, and academic, the Canadian context. Caroline and Sean, please turn on your microphone and it's your turn. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Can you see my um, slides there? Yes, I see. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us. Uh, Sean and I will be speaking about our research on local music collecting and collections, and we're going to focus on uh, the context of Canadian libraries. Uh, the name of our project is Sounds of Home, and this is a multi-year uh, research project that Sean and I began working on in 2018, and it's still ongoing. So this is a snapshot of our work in this moment in time. Uh, the purpose of the project um, is to study local music collections in cultural heritage institutions and we are focused on a Canadian context. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on the libraries that were a part of that study. Uh, for our work, we've defined cultural heritage institutions as any organization that has a mandate to preserve and make local music heritage available to the public. So examples of these types of institutions are museums, libraries, archives, art centers, community centers, et cetera. Uh, we haven't um, we haven't focused on anyone who has a private collection, just collections that are open to the public. Uh, in particular, our research is focused on understanding the values and the lived experiences and the perceptions of the people who manage local music collections. We really want to gather diverse perspectives on local music collecting and collections. And we're particularly interested 
on the impact that these collections have for communities. Uh, just to give you some background, um, in 2018, we started the project by running a survey of Canadian librarians who, uh, who are working with local music materials. And we wanted to get a snapshot of their collection management practices. So we asked those librarians about the scope of their collections and a variety of professional decisions that they make regarding those collections, including collection development, marketing access, and preservation. And then after the survey, we expanded our research focus and reached out to collectors and other types of institutions, including libraries, but beyond as well. And we started speaking with those collectors doing interviews. Uh, this portion of the research included um, recorded interviews as well as photo documentation of collections and site visits. And um, the purpose of those interviews and those conversations was to get a sense of the impressions that, collect that collectors had about the importance of their work and the impact on the community and the wider implications of collecting local music. We're actually still in the process of doing these interviews um, now since uh, travel is very limited. We're mostly um, trying to do them remotely. And we've also done a lot of the data analysis um, to identify themes from the interviews and the photos. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, so our interviews, as I mentioned, have mostly taken place in Western and Central uh, Canada so far. Um, and we're hoping to follow up with interviews in Eastern Canada uh, later this year. Um, and I've separated out some of the data about the libraries who were interviewed for this, uh, for this presentation. Um, you can see that we've interviewed people at a variety of different institution types, including public libraries, um, libraries in places of higher education, such as universities, arts organizations, um, libraries in folklore societies, and um, even a community radio station library. Um, We've also um, tried to vary the types of collections that we, um, that we looked at. So many of the collections um, were local in that they focused on music from a particular city, but we also spoke to some people who had a provincial um, music collection or even a regional music collection. Uh, we didn't limit the scope in terms of genre, so the collections focused on a variety of genres, including um, classical music, but also popular um, folklore traditions and, and also Indigenous music. One of the key findings from our survey was that local music collections and libraries actually often include archival materials or special collections, even when they're held in a library. And um, the treatment of these materials, you know, requires specialization because they require unique considerations for preservation and access. Um, many of the collections included um, materials that you'd find in a traditional music library, such as scores, sheet music, and sound recordings. However, it's quite common to find ephemera representative of local music scenes. Uh, some examples of this include programs, documents, um, such as recording contracts, for example, personal belongings, instruments, art, fan merchandise, posters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can see in this picture, this is a photo from a punk music collection. And a lot of the collection was donated from local punk musicians. And so you can see the t-shirt here has the names of some local bands and some of the pins that might've been distributed at a punk music show. So what this shows us is some example of what music the bands were, what bands were playing on the scene at the time, but also we get a sense of the punk aesthetic and the general tone that was happening in performing venues. And um, the collector talked about some challenges of working with this type of material. For one thing, uh, the t-shirt was quite dirty when they received it because the, per you know, the person who donated it had been wearing it. So they had to figure out how to clean it and then preserve it and store it. Um, so 
So I just thought that was an interesting example. In our conversations with local music collectors, we found that collections such as these serve a critical role in documenting local history and connecting to the community. Uh, librarians spoke about the value of representing the community through music collections. For example, they can provide evidence of community diversity, um, including music produced by marginalized or underrepresented communities, and also by collecting music that's part of an underground or DIY scene. And finally, many people that we have spoken to have described the importance of local music collections and the role that they play in documenting local history and the connections that can be made between space and place. For example, they might have a song in a collection that speaks to the history of a city, a local event, or a celebration. In, in a lot of cases, these local histories have not been written down. And so preserving these types of artifacts um, can really help to uh, preserve local memory. I just have a couple quotes here from some of our participants. Um, this person said, they were speaking about the value of collecting local music. They said, I just really believe in local content. I think it's so important, especially today. It's so easy for big companies, big record labels, all these big kinds of beasts in the industry to overshadow, I guess, for a legacy to be preserved, for people to look back and say, music was way more diverse than what's thought. This person is speaking about um, the value of places and, and how we can represent them in collections um, and the place that their collection is located. They said, this is a really special place and it doesn't feel like people are just coming here with a fully formed idea and recording it or splitting or performing and splitting. It's like they're working on something here and they're adding to the body of knowledge or information that's been going on since 1933. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Sean to continue with the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. If you don't mind uh, advancing the slides when I give you the signal. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'll very quickly just sort of talk about, so Carolyn's talked about sort of the context of the project, uh, the context of the collections themselves, and, and a few really great quote, uh, quotes from those collectors. And sort of the concept of the collector has really come up as an interesting uh, finding in our research uh, we, we talked to uh, primarily sort of what we call like professional librarians and archivists, uh, but also non-professional, which has been kind of interesting to look at. So what you might call DIY kind of collections uh, versus those institutional collections we uh, typically expect in libraries. Um, and as Carolyn's mentioned before, there's a real convergence of practice uh, across the cultural heritage sector in local music collections. So. This is a really interesting aspect, you know, that shows up in collection development, um, how materials are described and handled and promoted. We're really seeing a specialized set of skill for working with these kinds of collections that I think comes from both music librarianship and sort of as a local music uh, practice uh, specifically. Uh, collectors in community also, uh, by the nature of it being local music, it really necessitates strong ties with communities and a dependence on strong community engagement and relationship building, probably um, true of most uh, information work. But uh, we looked at some concepts like the post-custodial model and archival theory, for example, that uh, might serve as a good uh, starting place for uh, librarians wanting to work with closer with communities that maybe, um, let's say, aren't donating their materials right to the library or are um, working with them to uh, in a supportive role that's uh, erases those barriers a little bit between professional and non-professional. In terms of the geographic scope, uh, you know, users are often dispersed across a wider area with local music collecting, uh, so they may come in remotely. Um, so this, this includes things like online collections, which is a fascinating area of our research that we're, we're just starting to expand into, um, or sort of almost a folkloristic aspect where uh, music librarians uh, managing local music collections are traveling out into the communities uh, to gather information, to gather stories, um, sort of tying into things like family history research, local history research, music scenes research. These all came out as common areas of interest. So really noticing that this is a different area of practice in uh, librarianship uh, when it comes to local music. 
Uh, considering collaboration and partnership to bring in expertise. So this was quite commonly found in our research as well. So uh, often collaborating with whether it be local music societies, um, whether it be with musicians or associations uh, in a particular region um, to collaborate on things like outreach, marketing, digital projects, cataloging and archives management. Uh, so that's come up consistently as a theme. And again, probably something that's a theme in librarianship in general, but really, really strong in local music collecting because of its focus on the community. And finally, uh, you know, the work intersects with people's personal passions and commitments, commitment and interest. Um, so this is probably also very true of local music or music librarianship in general, but really we're finding local music collectors as sort of these devotees. So often they are people who are in these music scenes themselves. They have a personal passion that they bring to their work. So they have an interesting overlap between uh, their work and their personal lives. Uh, next slide, please, Carolyn. Uh, so here, here's a quote really demonstrating the community building piece. So this is a photo taken from the Toronto uh, Reference Library. Uh, they were running an exhibit on uh, For the Record called For the Record, which was uh, about local hip hop in Toronto. Um, and this quote just really speaks to this community building piece between artists. Uh, we heard a lot from them, like just meeting each other, being in that same collection together and reaching out and making those connections with each other sometimes led to creative connections. So um, this was a really interesting example when I was interviewing, it just so happened at Toronto Library, Toronto Public Library, there just so happened to be this exhibition. And they spoke about this really interesting collaboration between uh, local musicians who are running, uh, who had a collection of uh, hip hop history in Toronto and how the library was collaborating with them on programming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so this one, uh, this quote here is a you know, collector describing their own involvement in a local music scene and how that tied to their workplace enjoyment and community connection. And the item you see is an item from a community-based collection in the performer's personal library. Uh, so their involvement in local music collecting represented a deep personal connection to a particular scene. In this case, it was a traditional music scene in Ontario uh, and sort of this continuance of tradition through performance, uh, storytelling, immersion in the scene and uh, the ac aspect of archiving. So this quote's really great. I'll just kind of take a few highlights out of it. Uh, it says, I've really been involved in the music community, like setting up shows, giving music lessons. I think that was a big selling point for me when I was interviewing for this role. Um, I'm very community focused. Music is a personal passion for me. So this is kind of a dream job to get. So this, you'll hear a lot of this from these local music collectors that it's really a personal passion project that ties to their personal lives. And uh, next slide, please, Carolyn. Yeah, so very quickly, um, you know, cause we're, we're taking up uh, some time here. Uh, these are some of the emerging research themes from our, uh, from our project. So as Carolyn mentioned, we're in the process of coding our interviews. Uh, but so far, we're already finding lots of interesting stuff about space and place and its collection to local music. Uh, as mentioned before, community integration and how this maybe differs with local music practice. Uh, ideas of collective memory and how those are encapsulated in local music collection objects. Um, lots of issues of representation and diversity and how local music collections tell different stories that maybe aren't told in sort of main narratives in other kinds of collections. And uh, one that we recently uh, drafted a paper on, which really talks about affect, the emotional um, feeling that collectors and users of these collections uh, get uh, that is kind of unique and a little bit different than some of the standard practice in libraries. So uh, stay tuned for more uh, you know, research on this and presentations. And uh, just the last slide, please, Carolyn. So just thank you. And we have our contact information up here. Uh, we'd both be happy to answer questions uh, uh, for you about this project and there's a link to our website. Um, also always very interested to hear about uh, local music collecting in other parts of the world since our, our project is focused on Canada. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Caroline and Sean, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And I would like to remind you that if you have any questions to our uh, speakers, please free uh to ask them in a chat box uh, we will be answering them at the end of the webinar and uh, yes uh, we are going uh, to listen about providing access to audiovisual collections our next speaker jonathan manton uh, is uh, with us 
uh, here. And uh, Jonathan worked in Genmar Music Library at Yale University. He's interested in digital services, include, including digitization, uh, digital preservation, and access. So Jonathan, uh, there is a very important question. Uh, can we listen to that online? Well, I'll do my best to try and answer that. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, everything is fine. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and well during this uh, really extraordinary time. My short presentation today is focused on providing access to audio and video uh, AV collections held by music libraries. As you might expect, uh, music libraries often hold extensive collections of AV materials, which in many large university libraries can represent more than the rest of the library system combined. So for example, at Yale, where I work, which is the third largest academic library in North America, incorporating 500 members of staff over 15 different libraries, the music library holds around half a million physical recordings on various formats, as well as multiple terabytes of digital music files. Additionally, a significant amount of our annual budget now goes towards subscriptions to licensed databases that provide access to streaming audio and video content, many of which you are probably uh, familiar with. So in this presentation, I will uh, provide a brief overview of the types of AV collections you find in uh, music libraries, the different ways AV collections are used for research and teaching, uh, the different formats, both physical and digital that we deal with, and then finally, and most importantly for this talk, how we provide access to these recordings, which is now predominantly online. So there are many different types of audio and video materials that music libraries deal with, but generally they fall into two main categories. There's general collection content. This is mostly commercially published, um, often circulating collections. And then there are spare, uh, special collections, which are archival, often rare, and often one-off unique recordings. So that's not exclusive, but this is generally how these different types of collections, uh, you find them in music libraries. And then AV collections, uh, especially within a university environment, academic environment, which is the environment I know best, uh, are used for a number of different purposes, including course reserves. This is a limited time access, which is normally to support a current class. Uh, teaching, so used by faculty for instruction, for example. Uh, often used in exhibitions, uh, either physically at the library or sometimes at other libraries or even uh, online exhibitions as well, increasingly, or, or to support individual research. Um, and finally, often we will use sometimes, uh, we'll use things as part of library outreach, say on social media, for example. So there's many different ways that these materials are used. So within AV collections, either general or special collections, you then find multiple formats of AV materials, both physical and digital. In terms of physical collections, the most common formats found uh, in terms of audio, often uh, CDs, compact discs, uh, vinyl discs or LPs as we call them, uh, shellac discs or 78s. Uh, and in terms of video, you'll often find DVDs, Blu-ray, uh, 35 and 60 millimeter film, uh, VHS and pneumatic tapes. However, audiovisual archives, such as the historical sound recording unit at Yale, often hold collections of a wide assortment of all kinds of legacy format that have been developed since the birth of recorded sound and moving image in the late 19th century. In terms of digital content, then there are three main categories of digital collections in music libraries. First, there is licensed streaming AV. This is content that the library actually doesn't own but pays a subscription to a vendor in order to provide access often to thousands of commercial recordings that it can provide access then to its patrons. So some examples include things like Naxos Music Library and Alexander Street Press, for those of you who are uh, aware of those products. Uh, music libraries have increasingly moved towards using subscription databases like this over the past 10 years or so, and now often spend considerable amounts of their budgets on these subscriptions instead of buying physical recordings. While this move has certainly benefited patrons who have much easier access to these materials, the move away from owning collections and instead just paying to access them has raised a number of core concerns for music libraries in terms of their core mission to preserve information for the long term. However, that's a separate webinar for a separate day. Um, 
However, next we move to digital material that the library then does own. This content then breaks down into two further categories. You have digitized material and then born digital content. Digital, uh, digitized content is content that has been transferred from a physical recording. So digitized off a CD or a film to digital file. In most libraries, this digitization process is either done in-house in a ded dedicated unit in the library or sent out to a specialist vendor uh, a company that does this work for you. Either way, this digitization is done following national and international standards for AV preservation, often resulting in both a high quality preservation master file, uh, most commonly a WAV file, and then a low quali lower quality access file, which is most commonly an MP3 file. Born digital content is content that is created digitally and is increasingly the type of content being produced today, where instead of buying or otherwise acquiring material on physical me media formats, we are acquiring digital files where we can. Another topic I will mention, but I don't have a lot of time to discuss in more detail today, is that both digitized and born digital content must be digitally preserved in a digital preservation system. While I, focus, while I will focus the rest of this talk on access, digitally preserving content should actually be considered the first step towards access of materials. It's very important that we preserve this digital content to make sure it's available for the long term. So now let's talk about access. So there's basically two types of access to AV collections, either in person on site at, a lib at the library or online uh, via streaming or downloading. I think it's probably no surprise to anyone that the expectation of most library users now is that all collections are available online. This has become even more the case recently due to the current global pandemic where many libraries were or continue to be physically closed. However, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, aware of uh, making library collections available online is often complex, it's often expensive, and sometimes can require a lot of staff expertise and time. This is why the question, can I access, or in this case, can I listen to that online, coupled with the assumption by many library patrons that everything is online, can often be something that is very frustrating to us, those working in libraries. Um, however, I'm going to focus here on an example from my library at Yale on how we are providing access to AV digital special collections, specifically recordings from our historical sound recordings archive, as well as our All History of American Music collection, which holds over 3,000 interviews with American composers and performers. One, of, one important feature of many streaming AV platforms is the ability to provide different levels of access to content. These restrictions could be due to copyright. Again, that's a different webinar for a different, different day and it differs so widely across the international community that it's probably a series of webinars um, or restrictions placed on content by collection donors in the case of special collections, for example. Regardless, many access systems now used by music libraries provide four principal levels of access. There's public, ac public access, which is basically what it sounds like. It's openly available to anyone in the world. It's basically like the equivalent of the free content you find on YouTube, for example. Next, we often then uh, need to restrict access to our own organizations. So in my case, I might restrict access just to Yale faculty, students and staff. Uh, in this case, these people would then need to use their organizational login, e.g. their Yale login to access content. Then we might also need to restrict access to a smaller group, uh, such as a class. So this is very often the case for the streaming course reserves I mentioned earlier. And then finally, we might also just want to uh, restrict access to an individual patron. Additional types of restriction that might be placed on any of these levels of access, except for public, might be location. So we might only want to make content available in a specific room, say a reading room, uh, based on the network IP address for that space, as well as time. So we might uh, uh, limit access automatically uh, and say that it ends on a specific day or after a certain number of days. So there are many AV platforms available worldwide, but the previously mentioned types of access restrictions are often what differentiate systems used by libraries to those used by any other organization or individuals. Additionally, libraries have to, have to decide what type of software they want to use and how and who will host and support this. One option is to download open source software and host and support this locally at your library. While open source software is often is normally free, Configuring, hosting, and supporting it at a library is certainly not, and is actually only really an option, I think, for organizations with sizable IT departments uh, in-house. 
The other option is to pay a subscription to a vendor to have them do all this work for you. So this might be the software, software that the vendor themselves has developed or software developed by somewhere else that they just simply host and support for you, much like you might pay for a website hosting contract with another, uh, another company. So all AV access systems provide three principal elements. You have metadata, digital content, so the files, and finally, the ability to search and browse collection materials. So I realized in advance that this material is going to be incredibly difficult to describe in such a short period of time and in a webinar like this. But I'm going to quickly try and give you an overview of a fairly new system we have developed at Yale for AV access. This system was built uh, off work done at Yale to create a set of principles to which any access system must align. The first principle, this principle that you see on the screen highlights that access is not provided by some single system, but it actually is the result of a network of different library systems being connected together. So in our case, metadata describing digital AV items in our access system is usually sourced from our main library catalog or archival finding aid system. Digital content or files are sourced from our digital preservation system. And finally, search and browsing of the collection is provided by one of Yale's main library search and browse platforms. So these materials could be found alongside other library materials from across Yale University Library. So I'm going to try and show you basically what this looks like as best as I can. So this platform that I'm showing here is the finding aid platform that we have at Yale University Library. This is the front end to a product called Archive Space, which some of you may know. Uh, it's in other parts of Europe, many people are using Archivist Toolkit, um, but this is the front end to Archive Space, which is a product that we use for describing uh, archival collections at Yale. Um, so this is a single entry within a collection uh, of all histories related to Duke Ellington. And here you can say this is, an in, this is an individual recording. So you'll see here that there's metadata describing the location, the date of the interview, uh, the interviewer, the, proc the running time, and this actually has a transcript as well. Um, so all of this data is here describing this item. There is then a link that you see here, this big logo that says quick here to access. And when I click on this, I get taken to this screen right here. So all of this data that you're seeing on the right-hand side here is all the same data that's over here. It's actually being pulled by, from one system to another. So this is a different system, but it's pulling the same descriptive metadata and it's keeping them in synchronized, it's synchronized with each other. Then you'll see here that this says this content is locked and I need to request access. That's because right now I'm at home, I'm on a public uh, uh, network, I'm not at Yale. And so in order to, uh, it identifies me as a non-Yale user. So I can, uh, if I want to have access to this recording, I can either log in. In this case, I actually already have a login for this platform, or I can create an account and I can go ahead and request. But I'm gonna just log in here because I already have an account and I'll show you what it looks like. So now this particular account uh, that I have says that I have permission to see this material. So now it's just available to play right here. You wouldn't see the stuff on the left. That's just administrative controls. Um, and so for this, what we are able to do for external researchers is they're able to request access to materials. We'll often give them 30 days of access to use the material that they need and then the access will turn off automatically. And again, this content here is all being pulled from a digital preservation system. So again, I realize this is a difficult thing to describe in full right now because it's probably a webinar in itself. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of the kind of systems that some libraries uh, are using. Um, so I uh, thank you everyone for your attention. And if you do have questions, please, you can hit me on Twitter at John Manson or Jonathan Manson at yale.edu. I also have my slides uh, bit.ly right here, which you can go ahead and use. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for your presentation. And uh, now, um, we are going to our fourth speaker, uh, Sebastian um, Bilke. Uh, Sebastian is a new head of the Central Music Library and Frankfurt uh, Public Library in Germany. He's going to present three examples of innovative music services from Qatar National Library. Sebastian, we are very curious about your topic. Uh, please uh, don't keep us waiting. Turn on your microphone and I will help you with your presentation. Thank you very much, Magdalena. And uh, thank you for the invitation to talk about this uh, topic. So um, 
you might wonder why I'm talking about Qatar if I'm in Frankfurt now. Um, that's because I just recently have switched jobs. I've worked in Qatar at the Qatar National Library for the last six years. And in this very short presentation, I am going to show you three examples of how you might find music in a public library setting. In my previous role at, in Qatar, I worked in a public library sphere. There was um, both a national library, there was a big, uh, large metropolitan library, and we, have, we also served as a university library. This is why it says public library. And three, all the three of these examples can be found in, as trends in many music public libraries around the world. So if you could please switch to the next slide. On the left side, you will see, you are seeing a picture of my former library. It's a really stunning building, which only opened about three years ago. And it was designed by Dutch architect Rem Kohlhaas. Um, in this first slide, um, I want to talk about live concerts. So you find concerts of all kinds in public libraries around the world. They've becoming, they are becoming increasingly important, aside from the uh, collections of the libraries and other services, um, because as you can see in this example, they draw in lots of users and non-users of the library. These two pictures come from a series, um, which was one of the highlights of my work in Qatar. This, is a, this was a free chamber music series that we um, have established in Qatar together with the Qatar Philharmonic Orchestra. So in that particular case, there was a free monthly concert and people could come to the library and listen to classical music. You see that this is also part of the so-called library as a third place. Um, so at least two of the three examples I'm talking about today are can also be seen in this, in this setting. Um, if you think about um, music specific skills um, or um, other aspects um, that you need to uh, provide as a librarian in this context, um, there's a lot about logistics, obviously. Um, you need to deal with the musicians, you need to be knowledgeable about music equipment, about the music stands, about the lights, what the needs are typically of professional musicians or amateur musicians. You might also need to have um, music history or um, genre knowledge about the pieces that they are playing because you might need to help um, assisting during the performance. And of course, there's a lot of um, general event management skills that are needed to, to do this type of event. In this particular case, we had um, so far about 20 concerts, each of them with an average of 400 attendees. So you see that there's a lot to organize to manage both before and during the event. And in this particular Example, we also use the format to experiment. On the lower picture, you can see um, that there was a huge screen in the background of the stage. So the musicians, they used this to show, in this case, tango pictures because they were playing um, tango music from Argentina. Um, they experimented with um, arts. There was a live painting going on uh, during a concert in another case, and they, they experimented with the with the space and also with the format. So this was one of the positive outcome of this outcomes of this collaboration. The musicians, they saw that this is a nice venue. So as an effect in result, they approached us for more concerts that they were interested in doing at this place. And as I said in the beginning, um, it drew in lots of non users of the library, because the event was also publicized and promoted through the social media channels and website of the orchestra. Okay, could you please go to the next slide? The second um, example is a little bit connected. Um, in many libraries, you also see, as you've heard, um, online music streaming services that are becoming increasingly popular. Um, by subscribing in 
uh, to these types of services, music, public music libraries respond to a general change of user behavior. Um, most of us, I'm sure, are using Spotify or similar platforms and um, having access to Nexos Music Library, for example, um, helps in providing something similar in terms of the experience. And um, what I've done in Doha um, was to set up another collaboration with the Qatar Philharmonic Orchestra to provide um, curated online playlists. And uh, the way I did that was to create playlists for all the concerts of the orchestra. So their audience, as well as the library users could access the pieces before and after each performance. And um, this is also, I think, increasingly being done by other libraries around the world. Um, the music librarians, they can act as a curator to um, recommend resources, whether they be part of the physical collection of the music library, the online resources, or even external resources. But the act of curating is an extra benefit that they can provide to their users. Um, let's go on with the next slide, please. Thank you. The third example is um, also rather popular in uh, lots of lots of new libraries that you can see, um, and that's a music studio. Usually the music studio in a public library setting is part of a maker space, um, which was also the case in Qatar. I was able to build um, a whole music studio in one room. In this picture, you see all different types of equipment including analog instruments like guitars or um, some traditional instruments in that case, like an oud or um, some ney flutes and other things. But you can also often see a lot of electronic music equipment, music technology, like MIDI keyboards on the table uh, in connection with uh, iPads and um, also some type of software um, for music notation or music apps that you can show to your users. And um, could you please switch to the next slide? As you can imagine, this type of service also requires lots of preparation, lots of maintenance, and lots of specific uh, skills and knowledge that you have to have as a music librarian. You need to Think about aspects like how can you make this service available to your users? Some libraries, they catalog uh, their music instruments and equipment and make them accessible through the OPAC. So people can browse through the items, can reserve them like other media items in the library. You also need to think about storage. Um, on the top left picture, you see just one of many, many examples. Um, that you need to consider how to store cables. This was actually one of the biggest issues and uh, challenges in my in the music studio that I built in Doha, how to organize instrument cables because you have to roll them in a certain type of way. And um, then there's the whole thing of um, how to handle bookings of the room with the users, how to um, organize music instruction around that room. On the right side, you see a um, screenshot from a libguide that I built specifically for that room. And um, that's another thing you have to make sure. Provide the room, even if it's a self-service type of approach, um, how can you uh, provide information about the equipment, about how to use it, um, how to connect it with, uh, with music instruction manuals, for example. Later on, I will also share a link to that libguide in the chat so you can have a further look. All right, I think my time is up. Um, maybe can you go to the last slide? Thank you so much for this opportunity and um, please do ask me questions in the chat or also after the webinar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for your presentation. And now our, our last speaker, Barbara Dobbs mckenzie uh, we present Paumus, the fourth RS for major bibliographical series for music scholars and librarians. 
Uh, Barbara is an executive director of Reperto Internacional de Liberato Musica, a non-profit organization which documents which documents music research worldwide. Barbara, please turn um, your microphone on and try your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Hold on just a moment. Almost there. Can you see my slides? Yes, 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 I see. Wonderful, wonderful. Hello, everyone. I'm very delighted to be part of this webinar and to have a few minutes to tell you about the so-called R Projects for Music Research. So thank you very much for the invitation. To my knowledge, they are a unique set of resources, not only in music, but in any discipline. They are intended to provide bibliographic control over music-related materials that are required to do research in music. All have functioned under the auspices of YAML, the International Association of Music Libraries, and IMS, the International Musicological Society. Each R project is known by its acronym, which you see on the slide in parentheses, hence RISM, RILM, REDEEM, and RIPM, which sounds like alphabet soup, and it can be very confusing. But I am here to untangle any mystery in this perhaps confusing sounding names. So each R project is a bibliography covering a different area of music related materials, and therefore each one is a repertoire. So the names of each of the projects begins with the word repertoire, hence four R projects. And each one is international in scope, and that's why the second word of each one of them is international. Why the French names? Well, the first, RISM, was founded in Paris, and it set the precedent for all our project names. So again, therefore, we have the four R's, RISM, RILM, REDEEM, and RIPM, and that's in the order in which they were founded. The R projects have something else in common also, and it's a very important feature for all of them. The R's function on an international scale with contributions from scholars, librarians, archivists, and institutions worldwide. So you will see that, um, that each one covers a different area from this slide. RISM covers musical sources, RILM co covers literature about music, REDEEM covers music iconography, and RIPM covers periodicals about music. And just hearing that may raise a lot of questions for you. What are these things? And I'm about to tell you. So I want to take a moment just to thank the other, the other three directors of the other three R projects for providing some of the slides you're about to see. So we're going to start with the oldest of the R's, which is RISM. The mission of RISM is to document the current locations of musical sources worldwide. Musical sources here refers to music manuscripts, printed music editions, works on music theory and libretti. They are stored in libraries, archives, churches, museums, schools, and private collections. So without the RISM catalog, researchers would have a very difficult time indeed trying to find these sources. In short, RISM documents what musical sources exist and where they can be found. <clears throat> in over 35 countries around the world, independent RISM working groups catalog the musical sources preserved in their countries into a central database, which is managed by the RISM central office in Frankfurt, Germany. These data are published in the online catalog, now with over 1.2 million sources from over 40 countries. The catalog produced in cooperation with the Bavarian State Library and the State Library of Berlin is available free of charge. And my last slide will show you the, the link to the catalog. The RISM catalog offers a simple search as well as an advanced search with over 20 search fields, many specific to music such as scoring, key, music and chip it, catalog number and music genre. The catalog links to digitized sources wherever possible. The music and chip it search is a special feature of the RISM catalog, allowing users to search and compare the opening notes of a piece 
which is invaluable for tracking the dissemination of a work or identifying an anonymous source. The RISM catalog contains over 1 million music in chippets encoded using the plain and easy code. On this slide, notes have been entered in the shaded gray box, uh, search box, sorry, CCGGAAG. You can see the gray box there with those letters. And you all know what that tune is. And I, my apologies for anyone who has perfect pitch because I do not have perfect pitch. Da, 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 da. And now you will recognize it presumably. So the search of this tune yields the following. The Mo Mozart score you see on the slide is located in Prague and the anonymous song on the right in Korea. So you see why RISM is so invaluable. Now we're going to move to the next uh, oldest of the R projects, RILM. RILM was founded in 1966 by the renowned musicologist Barry S. Brook, who had a hand in all of the R projects at some point. RILM's mission is to document and disseminate music research worldwide. It's committed to the comprehensive and accurate representation of music scholarship in all countries and languages and across all disciplinary and cultural boundaries. Now that is a vast mission. And while RILM tries to cover all of the world's research on music, of course, we never fully succeed in universal coverage, but that is our goal. And as a result, RILM indeed is quite comprehensive. Here are the sources published by RILM. The first one is RILM's flagship publication, RILM Abstracts of Music Literature, a comprehensive bibliography of writings on music and related subjects published all over the world and in any language. As of now, there are over 1.3 million publications on music indexed in the database. Realm Abstracts was Realm's sole focus for the first 50 years of its existence. And then it became clear that not only did researchers need a comprehensive bibliography, they also needed full text resources for these items. That's when Realm entered the world of full text, producing Realm Abstracts with full text and then real music encyclopedias, MGG online, and Realm took over the publication of the index to printed music. So I'm gonna say just a few words about each one of these resources. Realm abstracts of music literature with full text includes all of the Realm abstracts bibliography and full text content for well over 240 music journals now in 40 languages. We add new journals to this list every year and there are approaching 400,000 full text records now available, linked from the bibliographic records. Real Music Encyclopedias is a continually expanding online repository of reference works on music. Currently there are 57 encyclopedias and reference works in the collection and new titles are added every January. So, so far over 300,000 encyclopedia entries are there and these titles were published all the way back to 1775 and up to the present. The topics include very general reference works and then specific um, targeted subjects. So it's a very eclectic wide ranging um, set of reference works that are published in this repository. And uh, typical for any international project, of course, the publications of many countries in many languages are included. And then MGG Online, which includes the complete content of the second edition of the German in music, uh, music encyclopedia, Die Musik in Geschichte und Gegenwart, with over 18,000 articles on people, 1,300 on topics. And this encyclopedia is continually updated. And finally, the Index to Printed Music, which is a digital finding aid for individual musical works contained in printed collections, sets, and series. So now on to our third R, and I realize this is kind of a whirlwind tour, but I hope it gives you a good idea of what each of the R's covers. Redeem indexes images and other artworks that contain music or performing arts related content of some kind. Now, why is that needed, you might wonder because before photographic images existed, before photography existed, 
Art images are there to provide a great deal of information to researchers, from images of instruments, which can inform organology, to ensembles, which can inform performance practice, and more, portraits, which can inform about composers and musicians, musical sources, uh, sorry, uh, and much more. And how do researchers find images that tell them something about music and its history and social contexts? by using Redeem, and that's its purpose. So I'm gonna just take a quick moment to show you a typical Redeem uh, card. Clicking on this first image takes us to this Redeem card. The Redeem database, by the, by the way, is open and free of charge to anyone. Um, here is the image that Redeem is indexing, and you see instruments here. There's a bagpipe, there's a Lira de Bracho. Uh, and this is the card um, that describes it. It's a painting. Here's the name of the painter at the top, the date of the creation, the size of it, the location of it, its description, what instruments are shown, bibliographic references at the, at the bottom. And I'll quickly show just one other and then we will move on. Another image here and similar descriptions and information about that image. So that is Redeem, oops. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have RIPM, the youngest of the four Rs. And what RIPM indexes is the musical press. So these are primarily journals from the 19th century through the middle of the 20th century. They're not the scholarly kind of journals, generally speaking, that, that realms area in, um, indexes. So RIPM and RILM are perfectly complementary with each other. So tell you, telling you a little bit more about RIPM, its mission is to preserve, reconstruct, and provide access to music periodical literature published from approximately 1750, so I should have said 18th century, to in the main 1966. Youngest of the four R's founded in 1980, and it has collaborations in more than 20 countries treating publications from more than 30 countries. And the purpose of Redeem is to address three fundamental problems. Copies of periodicals from this era are often difficult to locate, they're often incomplete, and they're often not in good shape. So it can be very difficult to get at the, uh, uh, these, these publications for research. The lack of indexing for these uh, publications is also difficult. The only way without RIPM to, even if you have the item, is to, to thumb through it but RIPM indexes it. Um, and then of course, there's a huge corpus of music literature uh, in the musical press from this era. And, um, and so there's, there's a great amount of information that needs to be findable. And that's the purpose of uh, RIPM. Here's a quick image that shows what the state of these periodicals very often is and why there is such a great need to digitize them, which RIPM is doing. Uh, RIPM partners with participating libraries. You can see them all there on the right, um, their partner libraries. And on the left, you can see their scanning stations and digitization and preservation um, projects. So this is a very packed slide, but it gives you all the inf information you would need about RIPM and its publications. They publish material in two different series, the annotated series and the preservation series. And the annotated series is, is an index um, by itself, similar to Realms, only for this different body of literature. And it also has a full text version. And the preservation series publishes repositories of full text. So there's no index behind it, but there is searchable full text for many, many, many hundreds, uh, for many journals. Uh, and the reason that's so important is because um, there's no way there's, since there are 7,000 of these journals that need to be treated, there's no way to index that many. So they launched the preservation series to at least make the full text searchable and available. And the, their latest publication is Ripham Jazz Periodicals, um, which covers 1914 to 2000, a very, very important year in jazz, uh, uh, period in jazz studies from the formation of jazz until quite recently. And it's the only such repository of jer, uh, jazz periodicals in existence, a very important new collection. So I will wrap up now. Um, thank you for bearing with me in that whirlwind tour of the four R's. Here is the website for each one. 
Um, oh, I see a typo. I'm sorry. The, the top uh, link there should be rism.info, R-I-S-M dot info. I apologize for that. Um, the other ones are correct, and you can find a lot more material on all these websites. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Barbara, for your presentation. And uh, yes, uh, we are nearing the end. I saw that um, many our that uh, many your questions uh, were answered by our um, our speakers. So uh, the last uh, look for our uh, our speakers uh, today's speakers, and I would like to thank you. Uh, all the, our webinars and uh, our sponsors for helping out uh, with the webinar. And uh, especially thank you for IAM, uh, IFLA, and my colleagues from New.